Okay, today I want to talk about uh, something we haven't talked much about in this class um, outside of some of our oil discussions, but this notion of general um, pollution, pollution in the ocean. Pollution has, uh, can take on a whole variety of flavors and we're almost out of time for our semester so we can't go into all the different flavors, but we need to at least touch on this as one of the management challenges that we have uh, going forward in the, in the coming years and, and decades. Now we've talked about these, these different categories of potential um, uh, threats to our coastal zone and uh, you guys have uh, asked about them and you've, you've talked to people about them and, and how would you guys rank these things? You personally, I mean we, we've seen what other people will do. What, what do you guys think? What do you guys think is the biggest threat of these four? Over harvesting, we well, got to vote for over harvesting. Vote for pollution. What else? Destruction. Pollution. Wait, sorry, Greg. What'd you say? Over harvesting. Over har okay, so a couple over harvesting. What else? Destruction. Okay. Okay. Fragmentation. What else? Anybody else? You guys are all wimping out. That was like four people voted. <laughs> How yeah, lame. Destruction. destruction. Okay, so a couple more of the fragmentation destruction. destruction. A couple more of that. A couple more of that. Invasive species of humans can. All right, we're starting to get into the cranberry sauce stage of Thanksgiving discussion. So, so okay. So this is this is not your data, but this is um, merging all the data from uh, the previous few years. I didn't do the last couple of years, but just to give you guys a sense. So uh, we've asked about in the past about people's thought about threats to wetlands, coastal wetlands to fisheries and then the coastal zone. Let's look at just the coastal zone in the middle. And this is remarkably consistent. So this is, um, red is pollution. Green is the uh, habitat destruction slash fragmentation. Purple is over harvesting. And the blue is invasive species. And these are means plus or minus standard errors from the several years that we've been doing this. And uh, again, ranking with one being uh, the greatest threat and then four being the uh, the lowest threat and actually sometimes a couple of there's a couple of weird things there with temperature a, a couple of questions we asked about fisheries we've asked a, a couple of additional things like ocean temperature and and uh, warm um, ocean acidification so that's all those extra two dots over there so sometimes when we do this we use a six point scale but that's why it goes beyond four but for the most part the stuff that we talked about that you guys pulled about uh, we focus a lot on this coastal question and so invariably, and we've seen this from the 70s on, invariably when we ask Joe, Bo, Joe Blow in the public, what are the greatest threats? Pollution is always what everybody thinks. And not only is it pollution, but it's pollution by a far margin, right? So the, everything else tends to be much closer clumped together. You know, pollution out here, these other things are together. Uh, pollution out here, in this case fragmentation is kind of close with wetlands, but everything else is down here. When we ask about the general perceived threats to the coastal zone, this is what people identify. Pollution and then everything else. Um, the Western Society of Naturalists just had our 100th anniversary and I've, I've sent out a, a survey to get people's impressions of how they behave and, and, and um, what they've done over the last, uh, you know, hundred years in terms of research and this and that as, as a retrospective to see what this society of professional scientists think about certain things. One of the things I, I also added on at the end just because I was curious was this exact question. So I asked the, the professional folks these same things. You know, if we're going to rank these four potential threats, what's the worst? And um, without showing you all of them because it's still in progress, here's where the scientists are falling out. So so um, with pollution, pollution is a mid to the end. It's, it's the uh, second to the last um, threat. So the professional scientists see pollution as a problem, but on average, not as great as over harvesting and fragmentation and all this and that. Now, are they correct in the general public wrong? Not necessarily, right? We, we don't have a basis to necessarily say one is better, but I think it is interesting that the public always perceives the threat of pollution um, or almost always perceives the threat of pollution um, to uh, 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 they're much more sensitive to pollution than to the other things I think that's because pollution is really easy to see 
Um, and in this little cartoon is a joke about, hey, just go ahead and throw it, destroy your plastic bag directly in the ocean and just you know, cut out the middleman, essentially. And so truly, I think plastics are one of the easiest things to talk about when we talk about coastal and marine pollution because we can actually physically see it. We don't necessarily need a chemical test. We don't necessarily need a sensor. We can actually just see it. So for that reason, I think it's a, it's a nice subject to talk about um, uh, pollution. So we'll just play a little snippet here of this this video. I'm not going to include this. <laughs> not going to include this in the podcast because uh, YouTube will tell me that I can't have Creative Commons control and stuff because this is a copyrighted thing. So, um, but anyway, but but we'll look at it anyway. So much was made right of this incredible substance, right? And what and oil is and gas, petroleum is are amazing substances. We, we really we started to figure out how to, how to manipulate and create um, different uh, linkages of these polymers into different lengths and, and all this uh, fun stuff uh, to create things over 100 years ago. But things really got going in the wake of World War I and then really in the wake of World War II. So here's a quote from 1945 on this publication called Plastics. And, it, and I'll read it to you, which is... Um, uh, they're talking about the, the, this, this new plastic age that we were, were about to enter into in the wake of World War II. It is a world free from moth and rust and full of color, a world largely built up of synthetic materials made from the most universally distributed substances, a world in which nations are more and more independent of localized, naturalized resources, a world in which man, like a magician, makes what he wants for almost every need out of what is beneath and around him. Again, leaving the, the uh, sexist terminology off there, right? So this was, this was, the substance was seen as a salvation, right? We can do all this great stuff now. We're not going to be tied to the tree, how many trees we have on our property to build stuff. We have this great building block that we can use both for energy, but also for material uh, needs. So here is the view more recently, looking back on that, um, on that uh, plastic age. The durability of plastics and their potential for diverse applications, including widespread use as disposable items, were anticipated, but the problems associated with waste management and plastic debris were not. In fact, the predictions were, uh, quote, how much brighter and cleaner a world it would be than which preceded this plastic age. We truly have a, an amazing diversity of plastic substances that we use uh, every day, that we touch these things. In fact, I've, I've, been, I've often thought what we should do as an exercise for ESRM 100 is just have students one day just go for a 24-hour period and record every plastic thing that they touch. Toothbrush, cup, car seat, uh, desk that you're sitting at right now, chair that you're sitting, all that stuff. I mean, we truly have plasticized our world in a, in a very literal sense. Um, sometimes we hear about this when we hear a particular problem associated with these things. And in this case, th these are some of the microbeads that um, we've isolated from some of these cleaning products. And uh, more about that in a second. But so many of the items that we encounter and we use and we fold it into our daily activities are, uh, while maybe originally they were made of other substances, now plastic is the dominant um, compound. Uh, Long-chain poly long polymers of hydrocarbons are the building block for so much of our society. So here, um, fishing net, which a lot of, some of you guys have helped us out with this project where we're trying to figure out how much fishing items, fishing debris has been left. Um, we sometimes think about plastics in the context of a garbage pile or a um, landfill uh, where we see these things built up. But increasingly, right, we see these all over, not just in the quote unquote disposal facilities or the, or the containment facilities. We see them in our rivers, etc., cetera, um, and uh, blowing around and moving around. When we see places like this, say one of our sandy beaches here in Ventura County, um, it might, this might look relatively clean. This might look rel relatively plastic-free, but unfortunately, it's not. Okay. 
Um, so uh, plastic is moved around in, by all the other forces that we've talked about throughout the semester. And um, in the context of the ocean, it's most obviously messed around with by currents. And so we know the oceans are these dynamic systems and we know that this is really a three-dimensional circulation process. Um, but to some extent, we can see the manifestation of marine debris because plastics tend to be buoyant, tend to float. So we can look at the surface phenomenon of debris and we see uh, two large aggregations in the Pacific Ocean of m primarily plastic debris in what people refer to as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch or the Great Pacific Garbage Patches. Um, we have two major areas. Uh, th 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 there are many sub areas, but there's two large areas, one in the Eastern Pacific, one in the Western Pacific. And each of these is, it, it, a lot of research is going on to how do, we, how do we properly characterize these, how do we describe these, but we're talking about areas that are on the order of magnitude of the state of Texas in terms of size. And um, there's a lot of plastic in there, a lot of plastic. So these things are just accumulating in these gyres and as, as plastic enters our ocean system, this is one of the areas where they are concentrated. In addition to plastics, the, the, the large plastics that you and I can easily see from afar, um, we've increasingly come to realize that a large part of the story is actually the smaller uh, particulate pieces of plastic. So we generally refer to those as microplastics. That, that those are plastic items that are less than um, five millimeters in maximum dimension and oftentimes can be significantly smaller than that. And these images are just showing some of the examples of stuff that we get. Some of the really, really small stuff, this is a scanning electron micro, uh, micrograph of um, our uh, microbeads, which are machined pieces of plastic to be a consistent size. So these are not pieces that were part of a much larger item that have broken down. These are actually items that were machined and, and created to be a specific size, generally to have some type of abrasion type of a quality. So you see a lot of these in facial care and skin, um, in um, what do I say, like, like skin soaps, you know, scrubbers and stuff like that, toothpastes, stuff like that. And um, in the state of California, we're in the, phase, we're in the um, process of phasing these out of personal care products. But, um, but plastics span a whole range of intentionally designed and unintentionally designed structures. This, th these materials have gotten into a whole suite of our, um, you know, all these nooks and crannies of our ecosystem. This picture on the left is a picture from uh, the 90s that my friend took when they were out on a, a what's called a Cal Coffee cruise, a cruise off the coast of California. And this rainbow runner was just some random rainbow runner and she took her knife and sliced open the belly and all of this plastic just came pouring out of the belly of that critter. So we, we have little tiny pieces, we have larger pieces that are clearly interacting with all the elements of our coastal and marine ecosystems. It's from a paper in 2014 where these folks went out and started doing cruises and uh, stopped every so often and checked and, and did a net tow and said, hey, do we have, how much plastic do we have in this chunk of the ocean? And then did their saying, did their counts, and then sailed on a little farther, et cetera. And so uh, the uh, coloration here is uh, the hotter the color, the greater the concentration of microplastics. And what you can see is um, as they got to the center of these different uh, gyres, you see that there's, they're obviously getting more um, debris per unit, air, per unit surface area of the ocean or unit volume of the water. This is not randomly distributed. So here, this is um, from that same paper. And so the, the colors here, blue represents areas where they didn't predict they would get accumulation. So areas were not in a gyre not in a large basin scale gyre. Um, and then the green is just on the outside of that, of that gyre, and the red is in the interior part of that gyre. And what you see, not, not surprisingly, is um, plastic is really being concentrated by these 
ocean surface phenomenon. The, the physical oceanography of the ocean is making areas with relatively hot concentrations of, of plastics and microplastics and areas with relatively low concentrations. Um, but notice that wherever we go, North Pacific, South Atlantic, we see this same phenomenon. This is not restricted to one particular ocean basin, even though in the news when you hear about something, you always hear about one specific spot. Uh, from our own work here at CSUCI, we've, we've seen th this, we've had, we have many more beaches now, but this is a data slide from last year, but these are 15 different beaches, uh, sandy beaches spanning a whole variety of locations. And basically all these, every single beach sand, sand from every single beach we've ever surveyed has plastic in it. Doesn't matter if you're in, on the California coast, if you're in the Cook Islands, Hawaii, Italy, wherever. Plastic is covering the entirety of the uh, beaches of the world, as far as we can tell, which is crazy, right? Because some of these are next to big centers where you might expect there to be a lot of pollution. Others are in, are in distant locations, but yet they still have a lot of stuff. This is the data from our California coast. This is Dorothy Horn's capstone uh, project. And she went and sampled sand up and down the coast from north of San Francisco all the way down to the Tijuana border. And everywhere we look, we find, um, we find plastic. We find both particles. So that would be part of, a, a, say, a, a cup, a plastic cup that was together. And then through agitation or ultraviolet radiation, whatever, that big cup is broken down into smaller pieces. The fibers are primarily coming from our clothing. The fibers are primarily coming from our rayon and our, our microfiber and whatever fleece, whatever you want to call it, but our spun plastic that's, that we use as cloth in the place of cloth in, in primarily our clothing. And, and so basically everywhere we look, we see uh, plastics up and down the coast. We've, we've yet to find a location in California that is plastic free. This is an interesting paper. Uh, uh, this is that 2014 paper. But uh, one of the things that I like in particular is this, this modeling effort. So they went and they basically said, okay, we got all this plastic out in the ocean. Okay, great. And all this and that. And let's, let's figure out what we would expect the encounter rate of plastics to be. Starting with, let's say, a cup. Let's say we have this plastic cup here. Okay. So we have this cup. And then over time, we might expect that cup to the waves to break on it and splash on it and the sun to bake it. And it's going to turn into maybe two pieces of plastic. And then eventually it'll turn into maybe four places, pieces of plastic and then on and on and on. And so uh, the red here in this figure, this is this is the distribution and this is the length. This is going from this is a log. I think it's a log scale. Uh, so this is going from, yeah, so this is going from relatively small, whoops, where are we? Relatively small to relatively large pieces uh, that we're going to encounter. And, and so the red here is the model. So this is what we'd expect to see based on, you know, let's assume X number of tons are going into the ocean, et cetera. The blue is what they found by sampling various sites across the ocean. So the measured di size distribution of plastic does not match the theoretical prediction of, of how these pieces break down. So why might that be? Do they start to sink after they get certain size of the small? So you don't oh, good question. So Greg's question is, hey, so when they get super small, do they actually um, sink out of the, say, the surface of the ocean where these guys are sampling? Good guess, but the answer is no. So, so this this size distribution, this red this red modeled accounts for all those things you guys are talking about breaking down, right? So, so uh, that's incorporated in the in the red prediction. So, why is the blue line differ from the red line? Let me ask a question: Is it is it is the is all of the mod, is all of the measured different from the modeled? 
No. Where does it differ? Right, which corresponds to what? Big pieces, small pieces? Small pieces, right? So this is the small size of the uh, side of the uh, smallest size of the plastic pieces. This is the larger size of plastic. So at the large end, there's relatively good agreement between our theoretical prediction of the relative encounter rate, right? But as we get smaller and small, so as we start to get smaller, it, it works, right? So follow me here. So we start here and everything is pretty good. We go down, we start to get smaller pieces. That's cool. Yep, smaller. Yep, that's cool. But then we start to get to this size and we start to get this divergence. And then it diverges radically. The smallest pieces, we're finding many fewer pieces than we would predict based upon just physical breakdown of a large piece of plastic. Why is that plastic, why is the small plastic missing? Yes. So Elliot's comment is being eaten. So, so this stuff is missing, is missing from the open water that we're sampling. And the best, we, we don't know right now, right? We're, we're trying to figure this out. But the most parsimonious explanation right now is that something is removing it. It's not, the, it's not gravity. It's most likely life. It's most <coughs> li likely things, organisms interacting with this plastic and pulling it out of the water column. Chris, you want to say something? Could it be that it's less than two millimeters? Like once it gets to a certain size in the top water column, it gets smaller than two millimeters. Uh, they can, no, because we, can, we still detect it there. So it's not as if a certain size is completely gone, but it's, it's relatively rarer than we would think if it was just the physical breakdown decomposition thing going on. Yeah, and Do we know if it's a like, fish or breathing it in? <laughs> Let's find out. Do we know? Do we know? Do we know? Do we know? So um, uh, the answer is we're seeing this stuff all over the place. Sandy environments, estu uh, coastal wetlands, uh, down at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so we're seeing it. So this is a, this is folks that were looking at um, old sediment samples. So they weren't necessarily going out to collect these, but they were using some museum samples. Um, uh, some of them they did collect themselves too. But but basically um, they're looking at deep water coral and deep water sediments from you know sites that are you know north and you know north of way north of Europe, you know south of Madagascar down towards Antarctica. And we find this stuff just about everywhere. Every site we've sampled, we've found some pieces of plastic. So we find it in all the beaches, down at the bottom of the ocean, we're finding it everywhere, right? And here's some examples of where we're finding this stuff. 2,000 meters down, 300 meters down, 1,000 meters down on seamounts, on can in canyons, you know, all this stuff. It is everywhere. From our own work, again, this is Dorothy's capstone work. This case, now we're talking about inside of sand crabs. So inside of one of our key ecosystem players, our keystone species in our sandy beach, and what we find is every single population that we've looked at and along the California coast of these critters that live in sand, live in the intertidal zone, have at least some members of their population that have ingested uh, microplastics, right? This is the proportion of all the crabs that we collected at a site have microplastics. So some of them, Mission Beach in San Diego has relatively few, only about 10% of those crabs um, when we sampled them. Same with Goleta, relatively small, and same with um, this, this area up in Monterey County. And sorry, th th these are, so this is the range of which we sampled. The color corresponds to the county that we um, where the samples came from. And uh, so range from anywhere from 10% of the population has an obvious piece of, at least one piece of plastic in their gut to on the order of about 80% of the individuals have at least one piece of plastic in their gut. So that's crazy. That's telling us that this material is entering the food web. That's telling us that this is a potential explainer as to why we're not seeing as much of that smallest of the small size class of microplastics uh, in, the, in the open ocean. 
lots and lots of plastics. Um, here's some other evidence. This is uh, this is stained. This, so this is this is false color uh, representation. But what we're seeing in this case, this is a piece of plastic um, in inside of blood cells from intertidal muscles. So the more we look, we haven't really looked until very very recently, just in the last year, couple years. But now that we're starting to look, we're finding this material everywhere in the beaches, down the bottom of the ocean, uh, floating in the water, inside blood cells. Um, this is what, this was, again, this is Dorothy's capstone, but the very first time we were doing a test in the purple, what you see here, this purple stuff, is um, uh, uh, dyed pieces of plastic that we ordered from a, from a store so that we could, we could you know, pick a color that would be really easy to see, and so the very first time we did this and we took one of these, it wasn't, it wasn't even really a first full test, this was just a trial. We grabbed a sand crab, was that super funny? We grabbed a sand crab and we put her in a container with some of these pieces of plastic in an air, in an air stone just for a few hours, right? Just to see if, what would happen and actually left it for 24 hours and then cut her open. And there was this first one, there was 94 pieces of plastic this is in, this is she's cut open here and so this is like her gut but 94 pieces inside of her digestive tract holy cow and so then we said oh hey let's let's uh we ran some controls as well just to make sure there weren't all this in this purple stuff floating around and we cut open the controls crabs that we did not that we held in a similar container that did not um uh you know expose them to this, these, these purple beads um, we cut them open, and yes, there were no purple beads in that one. That's great. But they all had plastic in them. They had plastic because they were eating it from the wild where we got them from. So it's crazy. So, um, yeah. So it appears to be increasingly clear that these plastics are entering the food web. So these toxins that we're talking about, when we talk about marine pollution, there's a couple different things. There's first and foremost a physical or acute impact that can happen from these substances. So you can imagine thermal pollution from a power plant might come out and it might, uh, you know, in an extreme sense, cook, cook a critter and kill the critter just acutely, right? Boom. So assuming that the substance doesn't cause acute death or acute mortality or a, a, acute change in behavior, maybe make them swim away or something, then we can talk about other things. We can talk about so-called sublethal effects of that exposure to that particular substance or that, that factor. And what we're increasingly finding is that the impacts are becoming uh, very diffuse and hard to quantify because they are so diffuse. So we've grown up thinking that uh, Casey spills his paint in the harbor and then the critters right there in the harbor die right because they ingest the paint and they die like oh my god Casey you spilled your paint lame right and we can kind of get a handle on it with a growing number of these toxins that we are releasing every day across the planet they're so ubiquitous it's hard to figure out what the control is right if everybody's being exposed to small pieces of plastic it becomes a challenge to say what's the ecological effect of chronic uh, low-level exposure to this stuff because everything we can we seem to find has been exposed to these things so so how do we know how they behave without this material it's getting harder and harder um, and so the more we look the more we find these substances in different uh, entering different aspects of the food chain um, this is this is uh, one that I like. This was um, a study done where these guys went to um, fish markets. So all they did was go to places where you could buy fish. So they went to Indonesia and they went to some places here in California and they just got straight up raw fish. So um, not fillets of fish, but the raw whole fish. Took the fish back to the lab, cut them open, took their guts out, just like I showed you with that rainbow runner and just said, hey, do these guys have any plastics in them? And this is what we see. So this is, um, it's, long story short, there are, there's 
let's see. So this is, what the heck is this? This is pieces of trash. Um, and then this is pieces of plastic. And these are, these are, these are chunks. So this was, this was presumably part of a larger item, say a plastic cup, a PVC pipe that broke down. So it's a, it's, a, it's a broken shard, you might think of it as. And then plastic fibers, again, are those microfibers, are those things that primarily come from clothes. And what we see is, and we're seeing this pattern in our, um, our sand as well, in uh, the developing world, we, we, we have a relatively high proportion of plastic pieces. In the, developing wor the developed world, where we have a lot of sewage treatment plants and, and properly treat our waste on average, fairly well, um, we see a, a, a higher proportion of fibers. So it appears to be clear, and some of you guys are doing this work for your capstone and stuff, but, but the short version appears to be that our cleaning systems, our water cleaning systems, cannot handle microfiber. So the fibers are of the scale, they're very small on average, and they're of the scale that um, goes through the typical physical filtration uh, 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 membranes and tools that we have in our treatment plants. Corey. Uh, last week I actually tested some water from the Moore Park Water Reclamation Facility. And I tested about 100 milliliters of water and I didn't find anything. Ooh, cool. Which is good. a good sign. So did you do above stream and below stream? No, no, I just took a sample of their water after it had been completely turned out. Cool. After it was cool. Good. When we've done it in the past, we've found it. But that's cool. I like that. That's good. Um, this is our approach, or this has been our approach to dealing with um, uh, plastics. So it's dominated by, as you'll see, and this is this is a very common occurrence. Um, we have uh, invent the stuff. That's cool. Hey, let's make this thing. That's cool. That's great. Let's do this. Okay, that's cool. And we don't see the concerns manifesting till much later. Again, um, we have to be careful when we talk about the, the policy and, and the management here. These substances were seen as a win for folks, right? These substances have a lot of benefit. You can be in the back of an ambulance and need a blood transfusion and we can pull out a plastic bag of blood and if the, if the ambulance is going over a bumpy road, you don't risk breaking that, that, that container of blood, right? So there's a lot of, there's a, and we can all think of a gazillion million um, advantages of plastics, real true advantages that, that, are, that are really good, right? So when, when, as with so many of our technological inventions, when we invent them, we're trying to make things better, we're trying to make things easier, we're trying to make things less energy intensive, we're trying to do all this and that, right? And we don't perhaps realize some of the downside until we're far down the road, potentially. And that's what happened here with plastics, right? So we don't really start to see the concerns for wildlife until the, basically the 90s, in, 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 a, in a wide way. There's some people earlier were, to, were, were saying stuff, but, but by and large, widespread concern doesn't really start to manifest until the 90s. And we don't really start to see legislation until the, la the last decade or so. And uh, indeed, you guys just voted on, on uh, plastic bag bans in the 2016 um, statewide elections. We actually voted on it before, but in the 2016, we had some uh, in increasing debate over what we should do with, the, with, with in, in this case, plastic bags. Here's a little snippet from that uh, debate. Um, folks were arguing that the, the four manufacturers from outside California that manufacture plastic bags were the essentially, I wouldn't say only, but 99% of the funding for those two measures that were voted upon last week. And, um, and their arguments were that plastic bags are um, a good thing, that they're convenient that they're great, that people can use them to put their, line their trash can and all this and that, and that by banning plastic bags, we're actually gonna cause more environmental harm. 
So again, plastic bags, very low hanging fruit, right? This is, we're not talking about shifting how we drive our cars or, or whatever. This is, this is sort of a pretty low hanging fruit where we have a pretty easy substitute, which is bring a bag with you or purchase a bag that's more durable rather than just one that's gonna be relatively thin and you'll be able to use a, f a few, once or a few times. And, um, and that's, uh, of, that's of interest, that, that that's a strange argument to make that we should keep making the disposable items because the disposable items are better for things. We produce a huge amount of waste um, now this is, this is you know much more than just plastic bags or the is the you know thing everyone wants to talk about because it's such an easy thing to, to think about, but we produce plastic in a whole variety of uh, fashions, and they get into the ocean from a whole variety of mechanisms, most of which are unintentional, right? So the the bag accidentally. You, you're, you buy your thing and you're in your car and you're driving down the road and you roll the window down because it's hot and the bag blows out the window or something, right? So accidental releases like that. But what we also now realize is that there's accidents and then there's irresponsible behavior. And so you can refer to that a couple different ways. We could talk about the mismanagement of plastic waste and that has to do with inappropriate disposal that has to do with inappropriate <clears throat> uh, coverings of, of the um, shipping containers, a whole variety of, of things. And what we're seeing here is um, countries that are ranked on how much um, essentially plastic leaks out of our industrial society. And the hotter the color, the greater the source of, of uh, plastic entering the the coastal zone and what you find is that Southeast Asia is the hot spot with China leading primarily because they're manufacturing uh, nurdles they're manufacturing the the plastic plastic grains that are going to in turn go into a lot of our manufacturing elsewhere around the planet so those folks just like China has become the the manufacturing shop for a whole variety of things they've also become one of the primary manufacturing shops for um, plastic compounds for, for for the building blocks for other plastic items so that's that's what's going on there the predictions are that things are only going to get uh, worse few folks are, are really aggressively trying to attack this challenge of uh, marine plastics and plastic <laughs> pollution. So these are some, a couple different forecasts, just like we do with climate change and CO2 emissions. Well, what if we, what if we took path A, okay, what if we took path B, what if we took path C, and uh, we see um, a, a tremendous growth, if not within, um, you know, several decades, a doubling or tripling of the amount of plastic entering the coastal zone. And so already, right, we're seeing these items show up on our sand crabs, show up on our fish. I, I don't have figures, but last week up in Monterey, we saw examples from uh, our wetland, wetland fishes, from Sebastes, from rock fishes off of our California coast. Every single fish folks cut open. And again, we're doing that here with our surf perch and other fish that some of you guys might be helping us with. Um, but every single fish that we've cut open and looked in their gut has at least one piece of plastic in it. And that's at the current level of plastic exposure. If we're going to double, triple, et cetera, the potential exposure, it's, uh, those effects are going to manifest even more greatly through the food web. So in summary, one of the key values and, and, and key value propositions of plastic is that, hey, it's great. It's relatively cheap, right? It's cheap in terms of we have a plastic soda bottle. We don't have to spend as much fuel to move around our truck, let's say, carrying glass bottles, right? So, hey, it's cheap. The, and plastic itself is cheap because of our, um, the global supply of petroleum, which is the primary feedstock for most of our plastics. 
we can make plastics from other things. We can make plastics from uh, corn and other substances, but but the vast, 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 vast majority of our plastics are made from petroleum as the as the um, feedstock. But this notion of this just throw things away, cheap, don't worry about it, etc. Um, that's it's not that cheap, right? Um, I'd say as legislation and policies has begun to try to come to grips with this, we're seeing a large pushback from the folks that are primarily in the business of manufacturing these items. And they have come out with a whole suite of, um, of arguments that are built around, hey man, don't you like to brush your teeth in the morning? That uses plastic. Don't you like to drink milk out of a carton? That's plastic with the idea being that you, we can't possibly change things because life is good with plastics. Um, and again, to be sure, plastics have brought a lot of great benefits to our society, but um, that argument uh, is oftentimes, uh, or, or is frequently, um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll, you, you, guys, you guys can suss out those arguments. Um, so I have uh, some links here I can share with you guys about, um, about this, this argument that, oh my God, we better use, better not get rid of plastics because everything's going to change. There, there's a great video that I've been looking for that uh, some colleagues from the American Petroleum who have shared with us in the past when they've given us presentations. Um, it's a great video. I can't find it on the web to show you guys, but it's essentially these, these folks, uh, this person going through his daily life and then the world starts to melt. So the, the mirror disappears, and then he gets in his car, and the car disappears. And the argument is, hey, man, if you take away plastics, your world is going to end. And um, I, I, don't, I would posit the world probably wouldn't end. But um, some people clearly would like you to think that. Plastics are an example of an unintended consequence. We created a substance that we thought would be a benefit. And turns out maybe now we're realizing there might be some downsides to this substance. Another part of the spectrum of pollution are items that we actually create because we know they're straight up toxic. We've created them to be as dangerous as possible, if you will. And so that would be um, a classic example. Of that would be something like marine paint. So we have fouling critters. As you guys know, anything we put in the ocean, things will start growing on algae, barnacles, you know, all these organisms will start growing in a little bit, not a big deal. But um, eventually we can get not just fouling organisms or, or critters growing on the surface of, a, of an item in the water. We can actually get critters that, and that's problematic. We can imagine if we're a boat and we want a nice smooth boat hole, we want to be able to cut through the water and, uh, and go fast. And we have stuff sticking off the back of, uh, off the side of our hull. It's going to slow down. It's going to create drag, and we're going to have to spend more energy to push our, our boat through the water. But then also we can have critters that actually eat into the structure of our vessel, boring organisms, clams and the like that actually sponges, that actually drill into and actually weaken and, and essentially rot away our wood or, or other boat structures. So because of that, um, one of the responses is, hey, let's put some substances let's coat those items that we put in the water with something that will not allow those things to to do that and so we see all these things all these um, uh, toxic substances and if we look at in, um, bottom paints in particular if we if we scroll down I'll just read this uh, ad from the uh, 60s so Z Spar which is um, a brand. Z-Spar Research delivers the latest, most powerful toxic agents obtainable. New developments include improved poison power in every bottom paint and a new formulation of color tox for racing sailors. Now you can have a gleaming white or brightly colored bottom plus effective anti-fouling power. So again, we, ha we have a range of, of things that are potential pollution sources, some unintended, others straight up uh, dangerous and you know we can, we can go through but these substances are really crazy the most uh, the lowest hanging fruit the, the, the most obvious tox one is this guy here on the right 
tributyl tin or TBT is what people oftentimes will abbreviate it as. And that substance is particularly toxic. <clears throat> in fact, in many uh, areas around the world, we've banned um, coatings and bottom paints and things like that that have tributyl tin because it is so toxic and the toxicity persists. It's not as if it's toxic today and then tomorrow it's not quite as bad, the next day it's not quite as bad. This is something that maintains its toxicity for a very long time and poisons a whole suite of, of organisms um, and kills them. Uh, in fact, one back in the day, not back in the day that far, but in the 70s, when before we started cleaning up LA Long Beach Harbor, and if you had, if you had a boat that was fouled, there used to be some places in the harbor you could go and, and anchor your boat for a couple days, and the water there was so toxic with, with just nasty stuff, you'd it actually poison the critters on your hull, and a lot of the critters would just fall off dead. So thankfully, you know, water quality's gotten much, much better, and we've, we've improved those, those areas, but, but these toxic substances can be quite persistent. Okay, so a little bit talking about pollution. Let's take a 10 minute break and when you guys come back, we'll keep talking about um, uh, sort of the overview of toxicity and uh, how we might want to think about that. All right, 10 minutes.